So I'm here to talk about what is certainly the most beloved and non-controversial gem in the entire Rails ecosystem. Of course, RSpec. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everybody loves RSpec, right? I'm, right after this, Ryan's going to come out and give you a talk just about how much he particularly loves RSpec. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to fulfill my role here and, and, and set up all the things that he's going to say in the next talk. Uh, so as I said, everybody loves RSpec. Um, RSpec offends me aesthetically with no discernible benefit. Uh, RSpec is a cargo cult. Uh, these also, by the way, um, unless you think this is a new argument in any way, shape, or form, this is uh, from March 2011. Uh, so this is a debate, obviously, that's been going on for a long time about RSpec's complexity and its utility. Um, and I'll just, like, I'll own it right here. Like, RSpec is complicated. Uh, I'm not a member of the RSpec core team. I didn't write any of it. Uh, I use it all the time. Uh, but I have no ego wound up in saying that it's uh, anything in particular. Uh, it's complicated. Internally, the internals of it are complicated. And while I do think that it has benefits that are discernible, and I would be happy to go over that some other time, here we're mostly going to talk about the complicated part. So when we talk about RSpec being complicated, and the things that I'm going to talk about here today are not so much the complexity of the domain-specific language that it presents to developers who are writing tests using it, but the, the internal complexity of it. And RSpec, um, there are a couple of reasons why RSpec is complicated. Um, I suspect the, RS, the RSpec core team would talk about how expressive RSpec is and uh, how much trouble there is a lot of stuff in the RSpec code base that is there specifically to allow you to express your tests in a way that is closer to natural language than it is to straight up Ruby. Uh, and a lot of the complexity of uh, RSpec internals goes towards supporting that. Um, RSpec's also very flexible. Uh, it supports two completely different syntaxes because the deprecated version 2 syntax is still there. Um, it runs in a lot of different, under a lot of different Ruby, uh, a lot of different versions of Ruby in a lot of different contexts on a lot of different machines. And obviously that's true of all popular frameworks in this ecosystem, but that has a certain cost in terms of the internal complexity of, of the code base. Um, and it's big. It has features that other test libraries don't for good or for or ill. It has them. Uh, it has a full featured, a very full featured mock framework attached to it. it has a very full featured matching framework. Um, if you're in JavaScript, you easily could be doing that with three separate libraries, and RSpec bundles them all together. Just to top off here with one quick example of how flexible RSpec is, um, I did want to say that with about 10 lines of configuration, most of which are things that are exposed by the RSpec API, um, I was able to turn this. Uh, this is executable RSpec with my configuration. Uh, I mapped thumbs up emoji to describe, uh, eyeball emoji to it, uh, pointy emoji to expect, and heart emoji to equals. Um, three of those four I did using stuff that is exposed by RSpec that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but yeah, RSpec is, like, it's not specifically there. The flexibility is not specifically there to support emoji RSpec, but if you want to do it, it's not that hard, for good or bad. So this is RSpec. It's not actually magic. My name is Noel Rappin. Uh, I work at a consulting shop uh, called TableXI in Chicago. I have stickers, and we are hiring. And if you want to talk about either of those things, you can find me. Uh, that's why I wear the green hoodie. Hi, everybody. It's so hard. It's so, there's such a glare here that I can't really like tell whether there are people out there. There are people out there, right? OK. Hi, people. <laughs> so uh, we're going to be looking at some RSpec source code from the actual uh, RSpec code base. The, current GitHub master as of a couple days ago. So this is your last chance to bail uh, before we start looking at RSpec code close up. Uh, if you have sensitive stomachs or something like that, you know, 
Fasten your seat belts. Make sure your tables are in their upright and locked position. Don't avert your eyes. Um, but I do want to say, like, why, why is it important, or why do I want to talk about the internal, uh, internal to our spec? I, I don't, it's possible that some of you will come out of this learning a little bit more about our spec as a user. You will probably pick up a trick or two that you could use in your own testing. Um, that's not really why I'm doing this. Um, our spec's a really interesting example of a domain specific language written in Ruby, and it has some techniques that you might use if you want to try to write your own DSL. Um, that's not really why I wanted to do this either. Um, really, like, I've used our spec almost every day of my professional life for about the past eight years, and it occurred to me that I really didn't have a serious idea of what it was actually doing. And I thought that was worth rectifying um, just because I, really, I was really curious and wanted to know. So that's what I'm going for here. Hopefully you'll come out of this with a little bit more understanding of, of our specs internals. So I always tell people that technical talks, even technical talks, should tell a story. Uh, there should be a beginning, middle, and an end. Uh, my story, I guess, is uh, once upon a time there was a test, and we'll go from there. Uh, this is a minimal our spec test. Uh, this is about as small as I could make it and, and still have it like recognizably do something. And we're going to walk through the stages that our spec goes through to convert this first to internal representation and then to execute that representation uh, and turn it into a pass or a fail. Okay. Now, um, this kind of looks like idiomatic Ruby and it kind of doesn't. One of the things that I find often helpful when you are in Ruby exposed to a domain-specific language or something like that that is trying to look a little bit different than normal Ruby um, is to start to parenthesize it and fully qualify it. And if you do that, you uh, come up with this. This is what happens. So there are a couple things that we can see right off the bat that are very clear once we parenthesize and qualify this. We see that describe is a method that takes one argument and a block. That argument is a constant name. We see that it is a method explicitly calling out the self receiver there. It's a method that takes one argument here and a block. And on the last line, uh, we see that expect is an argument, is a method also of whatever self is at that point. Uh, it takes whatever comes out of expect uh, is an object that expects to receive the method two. The method two takes as its argument something there that gets called, that gets returned when I call EQ. But it, it's worth noting that it, expect, and EQ are all defined in terms of uh, whatever self is when those, are, when those methods get evaluated. And those are the key, some of the key words of our spec our specs internals, or our specs DSL. We have describe, it, uh, expect, and then uh, EQ being a representative example of uh, our specs matchers. And so here we have describe, it, expect, to something. Each of those matches, each of those uh, maps to an, exter to an internal object or class inside our spec. So, Describe maps to an RSpec concept called an example group. Uh, it maps to an example. Expect uh, maps to uh, something that RSpec calls an expectation target. And then the two at the end uh, is something that RSpec calls a matcher. Uh, if you're familiar with RSpec in terms of a user of it, you've probably heard example and matcher. Um, and you may not have heard example group or expectation target because those are a little bit uh, less used by the public face of the, of the, of the library. Okay. So uh, just to sort of sketch that in terms of this, uh, this spec, uh, the describe defines the example group, and the example group sort of encompasses the entire describe, the, the block that is, the, that is the argument to describe. They all are sort of under the auspices of that example group. Uh, it, the example object, is invoked by it and it covers the block that is passed to it. Each individual called it gets its own example. Um, the expect 
and its argument are the expectation target, and then the matcher is that self.eq. So we're going to walk through this uh, step by step in terms of our spec's internals. So it starts off when our spec executes that code, when our spec loads it, the first thing it hits is that describe call, uh, which creates an example group. And describe uh, is a method, it's defined, it's actually defined somewhat indirectly as a class method of example group to create new ones. Um, one of the things about the RSpec code base and the RSpec code base examples that I'm going to show you is that most code in RSpec has at least one more level of indirection than you would expect. So in some cases, I'm going to show you like something that is along the way of the RSpec call stack and not exactly the method that you think you're calling because it's actually defined in terms of something else. Um, describe is actually, there's no place in the RSpec code base where you'll see def describe. Uh, RSpec has a method called like define example group method and then describe is defined as an, as a, as an instance of that or a, a example of that, an alias to that. The examples to describe are the description, which is typically a string or a constant, and then RSpec's metadata, um, which is a set of keys or key value pairs, which we're not going to be talking a whole lot about, except that RSpec just sort of holds onto them and can use them in its uh, execution. And what describe, what happens when you call describe is that RSpec creates an anonymous subclass of example group and then executes the block argument in the context of that new anonymous subclass. So here's a piece of that code. This is from the part of example group. This is sort of called along the way uh, as that example group gets created. And the first thing that happens here is um, you see that we're using Ruby's class.new to create a brand new class. The parent uh, of a top level describe is example group itself. And as you nest, they become subclasses of each success successive nested uh, example group in turn. Um, once you have that subclass, it calls out to a method called set it up, uh, which you'll be surprised to learn does some setup. Um, Specifically, it mixes in the matcher and the mock package. So if you're not using RSpec's mocks, like that's where it gets mixed in. Um, and then RSpec uses the module exec Ruby function uh, to execute the block, that block argument, if it's there. And hold on to that thought for a second. Um, and then it defines some extra helpers, and then it returns that new class. Whoops. And then it returns that new class. So module exec. Uh, module exec is core Ruby. It's one of a sort of trio of module exec, class exec, and instance exec. And, what, and those are very frequently used by domain-specific language implementations to control how a block gets executed and make a block not get executed in the context where it looks like it's being defined. And Specifically, module exec uh, has the receiver. This is the example. This example is actually from the Ruby core documentation. Module exec, you can see in the middle, it has a receiver um, thing uh, and then a block. And when I call module exec, that block is executed in the context of the receiver as a class. And what that means is that for the purposes of module exec, inside that block, self resolves to that outer um, object, and it, it, it treats the contents of the block as though it was inside, effectively inside a class definition. So in this case, I am defining a method, uh, and I'm effectively reopening the thing class uh, and defining the method inside that so that once that module exec call is done, I can create a new thing and call that hello method on it, and that will work. So in... Um, if you look at what that means in terms of what the, the code, the RSpec code that we are looking at, um, so RSpec describe returns this example group subclass, and then we module exec that. Uh, and that block is where we have befores and afters and its, and that block gets executed by RSpec in the context of that um, that subclass. So when I say self.it, um, that, that self inside the block uh, 
uh, refers to that example group subclass, and it is a method defined on that subclass, as is um, before and let and all of those things are all methods defined on example group that get executed here when our spec does this module exec. Okay. So uh, we, call, we call the method it. And it, in our spec terms, creates an example object. There are a number of different things that are defined to be able to create example objects. Um, again, our spec defines a generic method, uh, method and then defines it and specify an example um, as, as uh, aliases to that or as, as versions of that. It takes as a description a meta, uh, some metadata, again, and a block. And what happens when you call it is that our spec holds onto that example object in that block and adds it to an array that is a class attribute of that anonymous example group class that, we've all, that, we had, that is its parent example group. So here's a piece of this code. Um, you can tell that it's kind of uh, several layers of indirection deep because I haven't even given you the method name here. Um, but this is part of the code that gets executed as the example gets created from the RSpec, core, from the RSpec code base. Um, we have a bunch of stuff here that handles some bookkeeping around the metadata. Um, this is also where, if you've specified that this code, that this example gets skipped, this is where that gets handled. Um, but basically what happens here is that RSpec creates a new instance of this example class. Um, it, the arguments to that are self, which is the example group, the description, the metadata options, and the block. Uh, it attaches that to an examples uh, property of the group class um, and then returns the newly created example. Okay. So at that point, our spec has now loaded all of the things that it needs to load. It's executed the block um, inside the describe. It hasn't executed the block inside the it, but it's holding on to it. So at runtime, our spec actually creates an instance of that anonymous example group class, uh, and then the new instance runs all of its examples. And that happens in three stages. The example group has a method that sort of goes through all of the examples. That method spins off to a new method, to a method uh, that runs each individual example, and that method spins off to the example itself to actually handle its own run. So let's look at some of that code. Um, this is a little small. I'm going to zoom in in a second. But this is, the, this is the, what gets called on the example group when it gets executed. And it, there's about three or four stages to it. The first stage here uh, just sets up stuff. Uh, if our spec has already decided it wants to quit out, it just bounces right at the top. Um, it tells the reporter or the formatter that an example group has started because the, the formatter might do something in response to that hook. Uh, and then it looks for context hooks for any of its descendants. Mostly, this is mostly just bookkeeping. Inside a begin block, uh, it then looks for, uh, it actually runs the before method if, there, if any exist. Uh, and then that second line there, run examples, we'll zoom in on because that's where it actually starts to run uh, all of the examples. Once all the examples have run, that, that method returns a true or a false. It looks for nested children and runs all of them uh, and determines a true or false for the entire group based on its own, its own pass or fail status and the pass fail status of all of its children. So results for descendants. And then it, it handles some exceptions. Uh, if it skips, if there's a skip declared, it, it bounces out. Uh, the bottom exception here is, I believe, called if there's actually an exception in a begin block or something. Uh, it, it goes there uh, and, and tells our spec it wants to quit if our spec is in fail fast mode. Um, that returns false uh, because the, 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 that's a failed spec. Uh, and then at the end, no matter what has happened in the insure block, it, it runs all of the after hooks. Uh, and then it tells the formatter that it's done with the example group because the formatter, again, might do something in response to that. Okay. So it's only this one line. This was supposed to be uh, 
This one line, run examples, is the thing to zoom in on uh, to see what, hap what it actually does for each individual example. And so this is the code that actually that handles all those examples. The first line there, that ordering strategy order, examples that it plans to run, and then it maps them. So we're going to get a true false for every individual one of these examples by using map. And so first it bounces again if our spec has decided it wants to quit. Um, it creates a new instance of the example group for each test, sets any instance for set, uh, and then defers off to the actual example to run it. Um, and if, if, the, if that example has failed and we're in fail fast mode, then our spec tells itself that it wants to quit. And then it returns true false if it succeeded, if it has succeeded or failed, and uses the all method. The map will return a list of trues and falses, and the all method will return true if all of the individual examples are true. So that's, that's what the example group does. When the individual example gets control, it first checks to see that it's not pending and actually should run. It runs its before blocks here. I'll, I'll put actually, put actually put the code up. Um, checks to see, uh, so first of all, it runs any before hooks. And then it, this is the part that actually runs the test. Like after, you know, we're like 45 slides into this. Uh, this is the part that actually runs the thing that we think of as the test. Uh, it, it creates, in, it takes that instance of the example group and it instance execs that block inside that, inside that uh, group. If it's pending, we, we stop, we break out. If an exception has been raised because the test failed, we hold on to that exception because we're going to need it for reporting. Uh, and then at the end, we run cleanup if there's cleanup. And then we finish, which passes uh, whether this is passed or failed to the formatter, again, because it'll want to put a dot or an F or do whatever it does. skeleton of what this is doing for its four blocks. But inside that it, uh, it actually has to do something to determine whether the spec has passed or failed, which our spec does with expectations and with matchers. So that line of code in this test, that line of code in this test is um, the expect, it, we're expecting something to equal something else. And that expect method call that expect method takes in an argument which can be an arbitrary Ruby object and it returns an R spec object called an expectation target. Um, the expectation target basically all it does is it responds to two and it responds to not two to determine how it handles the matcher that it's been called with. Two and not two both take R spec matchers as arguments and evaluate whether those matchers are actually match or don't match. And a matcher at its most simple is just an object that responds to the API is matches question mark. So our specs, that what we had there was two EQ, the EQ method, which is defined, EQ is one of several built-in methods that our spec defines in a module called our spec matchers. There are all of these shortcut methods that uh, basically are just really thin wrappers around these matcher objects. In this case, the matcher object is called built-in EQ. All of the things that you use as default RSpec matchers are defined in this one RSpec matchers file, uh, and most of them simply defer out to a more complicated object that handles the actual matcher. So if we resolve both of those pieces, we wind up with uh, an expectation target object that's using its two method, and it's being, the argument there is the matcher, the EQ matcher, which also has its own argument. The EQ matcher determines whether it matches or not by comparing whether the two values it's been called with uh, are equal. So what happens here is that uh, that expectation target two defers to a method that eventually calls match for the actual matcher. In this case, it returns true. The two strings are identical. The matcher boils that up as a success. 
uh, because it's been done, because it's been called as a, because we've used two, so we're, using for, we're looking for a positive expectation, it boils that up as a match and it succeeds. Uh, if we had been using not two, it would have, the matcher would still have matched, but the expectation target would have considered that to be a, not the result that we were looking for and it would have raised an exception that would have uh, gone to the reporter that, would have held, that, that uh, the example group would have held on to for final reporting. So that's the flow, that's the basic, that's, it's not really the basic anything, but that's the workflow. Our spec creates these example groups that create uh, examples that use these expectations and matchers to, um, uh, to determine whether what you've, what you've stated as your expectation is actually uh, carries. There's one other trick that I wanna talk about here for our specs matchers, uh, which is the implicit matcher so our spec has an implicit matcher where if you do uh, B underscore anything, uh, as, so in this case B underscore value, uh, it defers to a uh, predicate method of the object. So in this case it would look for a valid question mark uh, on my name object. And the way that that works is it's a method missing. Here's the, here's the code inside the R spec matchers module. There's a method missing which is invoked because be valid is not defined anywhere. And then the method missing uh, compares against a regex. Uh, so we have a top, a, there, there, it actually looks for two different kinds of things. Uh, the B predicate reg, regex looks for B or B a uh, or B an. Uh, and then the has regex looks for have uh, and just switches it around. The, the have regex lets you say something like expect something to have key uh, rather than, and then it defers to the has key method uh, so that your test sounds grammatical and not like a, a lolcat meme. Um, the, B, the B one is what we're looking at here though. So B valid matches that B predicate uh, and it creates, it actually goes to a matcher, this, this object built in a B predicate, uh, which takes in that method name and the arguments and the block and in the fullness of time uh, comes to a some code inside that matcher uh, where it checks to see whether that predicate is accessible and whether it matches. So it has some code that I didn't show that converts B valid to the valid question mark method. Um, it checks to see whether that method actually exists uh, and whether it will, uh, uh, sorry, it looks for it in either, it, it looks to see whether that method exists and then if the method exists, it uses a double underscore send to dynamically invoke it and return true or false, uh, whether uh, determine whether the matcher passes based on whether the predicate is true or false. Um, it uses double underscore send here because that is much, much less likely to have been overridden uh, by the actual object, whereas it's at least theoretically possible that the object might have overwritten uh, regular send. So the emoji trick, uh, <laughs> A brief interlude for the emoji trick. Uh, the emoji trick takes advantage of these define example group methods and define example methods that I showed before. This is also from our spec. This is from the internals of example group. And it's just all the different define example group method is the method that our spec uses to say what an example group should do when it's created. Um, and these are all the ways that you can, by default, create an example group in our spec. You're probably familiar with describing context. You've probably never used example group. Um, you may have used X describe and X context, which automatically pass along metadata to say that the, that example group gets skipped, or F describe and F context, which automatically uh, pass along metadata uh, to, to say that that example group has focus. Um, you could do something similar with methods, which you can use specify it. I don't, for some reason, it fell off the slide, um, but specify example F it X it. Uh, all of which uh, pass along metadata. So what I did then is I just reopened example group. Um, oh, formatting got a little strange here. I reopened example group and defined an example group method and an example method in terms of the emoji I wanted. Um, and inside matches, I used the similar alias matcher method to use the heart emoji. Um, and then I just sort of brute force overwrote uh, there's no easy way to get at an, an alias for expect, so I had to kind of brute force, uh, brute force it. This does what, this is essentially a copy of what expect does. 
Um, and I, I suppose I could have used a straight alias, a regular Ruby alias. Um, and then with that, then this, then this code works. Um, so if you want to define your own uh, emoji uh, and really, you know, earn the love and respect of your coworkers by doing so, um, it's that simple. There's one other thing I want to talk about before, uh, before I left, which is I wanted to talk a little bit about how RSpec's mock package works. Um, mocks, again, not what Ryan is going to do to RSpec in the next talk, but mocks as uh, test doubles. Um, so here's a minimal mock example. Uh, we have a user. We say that we expect the user to receive a method called credit rating and return 1,000. And then we call something else that has its own expectation. But we've also set up by saying that we expect the user to receive, we're setting up an expectation that that user um, will receive that method. And this, the, this, this test will fail if that method does not get invoked. So, I wanted to think for a second just abstractly, like what has to happen in that line of code, that to receive, all the bookkeeping that has to happen for our spec, for the mock package to work. Okay. A couple of different things have to happen. Um, our spec needs to ensure that the underlying method is not called and that instead the value that you've specified is returned. Our spec also has to track how often that method gets called and with what arguments because that's used to determine whether the mock passes or fails. Uh, and then at the end of the test, it has to determine that all those expectations are met. Okay. In order to see how that's done, we need to talk about uh, two things. First is the way that Ruby method lookup works. Um, you may or may not be familiar with this. Ruby method lookup first looks in a thing called the singleton class of the instance. Then it goes through instance methods of that, of that class. Um, included modules, parent methods, and parents included modules, and so on. The part that I'm interested, most interested here is the singleton class, because that's the first place that Ruby looks, and it's the place that's usually not used. Uh, the singleton class, you may have seen one or two of these syntaxes. Uh, every object in Ruby has this weird little thing called a singleton class that basically exists to define methods on. Uh, you can use that class uh, shovel operator syntax to get at it. You can use, you can define something with an actual instance dot uh, method name. And in both cases, what happens is you create a method that only exists for that instance and no other object in your object space, which is perfect for what a mock wants to do. A mock wants to be a method that exists for that one particular object and no other objects in your object space. So what our spec needs to do uh, effectively, these are the concepts here. This is a, a kind of a bad diagram. But we have the original object and its singleton class. And our spec sets up this, this structure um, where our spec has this concept of a proxy uh, and a method double and space. Uh, and the method double uh, actually gets pushed into the singleton class of the original object to be the first place that Ruby will look for the method to get called and to return the value that you've specified rather than the actual method. The proxy holds on to th information like how often that method has been called, what arguments, and that kind of thing. Uh, and then the space is the list of all of the proxies that are defined. So if you define two, if you define two separate uh, mocks, mocked methods on the same object, uh, the space, our spec will use the space concept to ensure that they both those, both of those stubs get attached to the same proxy. So let's look at a, a little bit of code. Uh, because what, what happens here is as our spec's getting call, calling this as uh, an argument to, to uh, receive actually is a built-in that creates a matcher, just like EQ did. And that matcher is defined, that matcher, just like EQ, is a very thin wrapper around an actual larger object. In this case, it's called matchers uh, receive. And that takes in the method name being, being stubbed and, the, and an, argu an optional block, because most things in, in our spec can take blocks. But in this case, we don't need to worry about that block. Um, inside the receive matcher, there's uh, some bookkeeping that goes on. But basically what happens is uh, our, our, our spec sets it up so that it creates a proxy and calls this, causes this add method message expectation method to be called on it. Um, 
RSpec looks at its existing proxy space to determine if there's a proxy for, to get the proxy for the method being for the object being stubbed, uh, and then it creates this method substitute, which uh, eventually, again, there's a couple of layers in direction here, but eventually that add method message expectation gets called. It creates this method double object uh, and adds an expectation to it. And then that method double object um, holds on to the original method, holds on to reference to it, and then it uses class exec. In this case, the definition target is the object being stubbed. Class exec gives you the singleton class of that object, and it's basically defining a method to go into that singleton class. That method has the name of the method being stubbed, and the body of it is the method double basically uh, doing whatever you've specified, whether you've specified a return value or a block or a, a couple of various arcane ways that our spec works. Uh, that's, that method gets pushed into the singleton class so that for that object and only for that object, the stub method is captures that method call and returns both returns the behavior that you specified and also tells the proxy that the method has been received with the arguments because then the proxy um, can keep track of that. And then at the end of the test, RSpec has an afterhook, which is specifically for the mock objects, for the mock package to clean up after itself. And what it does is it walks through the space. It goes to that space object and says, are there any, are there any proxies? For each proxy, it says, do you have any message doubles? For each message double, it says, do you have any expectations? And for each one of those, it says, was that fulfilled or not, given how many times this was called? Um, and then uh, that happens after the test runs, after all the teardowns, uh, RSpec goes through and validates all of those and determines whether the test passes or fails. So that's a lot of stuff. I know this was a lot of code flying at you very quickly. It kind of scratches the surface. There are a lot of cool things that RSpec does that uh, we, I couldn't cover because I'm already pushing time. Uh, and this was already like a freight train of code coming at you. Um, I hope that you found this valuable. Uh, if you want more information on RSpec, the RSpec documentation at RSpec Info, which is not the Relish documentation that comes off the cucumbers, this is their straight documentation, um, is actually pretty decent. Um, the code base is actually not all that hard to read um, once you get used to how it kind of indirects stuff. Um, or you can find your local RSpec core member. I happen to work with one uh, and pester them to tell you how things work. Uh, if you don't happen to work with an RSpec core member, uh, <laughs> find one online and pester them. Um, in the meantime, uh, I'm Noel Rappin. Again, I work at TableXI. You can find me on Twitter, at Noel Rapp. Um, I occasionally write books. I have a couple that you might be interested in. Uh, I have a book on testing Rails stuff. Rails test prescriptions. Uh, it's really not so much about Rails as it is about testing in general uh, through Rails. Uh, that's available at pragpocket.com. For a limited time only, and I have no idea how limited because they didn't tell me, the code test 2 rappin should give you 25% off both the ebook and the physical book if you buy it through Pragmatic. Uh, also, I do some self-publishing. Uh, I have a JavaScript book, and, uh, uh, which you can get at nolrappin.com. And I have a book called Trust Driven Development, which is about projects and estimation and how to make your clients like you um, or how to behave worthy of your clients like you. Both of those are available at noelrappin.com. Both of those will be having updates and price, ranges, price raises in the relatively near future. So if you want them, uh, they will never be available for cheaper than they are available right now. Um, thank you for the time. I hope you found this valuable. Thanks for spending uh, a little bit of your time with me. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. And I hope you will recover from my fast talk freight train of code uh, for the last 40 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.